Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Today we are continuing our series on reconstruction and what we're doing is we're taking this buzzword in society, deconstruction, and we're looking up this idea of how do we reconstruct our faith. If you don't know what deconstruction is, it's the idea that there might be some ideas in Christianity that might be man-made doctrines and people deconstruct from the faith and they walk away from God for these reasons. What we're saying here at Family Church is it's okay to deconstruct some of the things about church that are man-made. It's okay to deconstruct some of the ideas that are not godly. But we better build them back up being led by God's spirit. We better build up these ideas with the word of God. So a few weeks ago, I was sitting down and I was on a trip. And the way that this trip was set up, I pretty much had to sit still in the same spot for seven hours straight. Yes, it, it's a, something, it's, I'm going to be honest, something dies inside of you. <laughs> sit still for seven hours. It could be extremely boring. You want to move, you want to, it's a sniffer, you want to walk around and go use the bathroom. But I just had to sit still. So because I was sitting still for seven hours, I had the wonderful and horrible idea let me just read through the book of Proverbs in the Bible. So the book of Proverbs is known as wisdom literature. Say that with me. Say wisdom literature. And what wisdom literature is, is it's a genre in the Bible that kind of shows you here's how to live a wise life. Here's some steps you can take to be a wise man. And on the flip side, here's some foolish things that you want to avoid. So as I was reading through the book of Proverbs, I was feeling personally attacked. I feel like the author was following me around and saying, don't do what he does. Don't do what he does. Do the opposite of what he does and then you'll be fine. I feel like it was a commentary on not, what not to do of my life. For example, a few months ago I was having an issue. And this issue got me really angry. It got me so angry that I grabbed a friend of mine and I start complaining. I start yelling. I'm like, dude, why would this happen? Why would this person do this? And I go, I give full vent to my spirit. I am completely venting. And then I'm sitting there in the woods trying to be a good Christian and read through Proverbs. And the author Solomon, he says, a fool gives full vent to his anger. And some other translations say a stupid man gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. And then in parentheses it said, unlike Pastor Josh, <laughs> right? So I'm like, all right, thanks, Solomon. Th thanks for making me feel great about myself. Another time I was a part of an organization and I was getting disciplined by one of my leaders because I did not do something that I could have done. It felt in that moment like, listen... I was doing a lot for the people that needed something. And it feels like they weren't holding up their end of the deal. And I was getting disciplined in this moment. And I hated that feeling. I was like, this is not fun. How can anybody enjoy being disciplined? And I hated that feeling. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But one who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> Thanks, Solomon. I'm feeling so encouraged today. One more, I got an email. And I read through this email, and I'm like, that's not, that, that doesn't sound right. And I just go typing away all about this email. And I'm typing away. I had no restraint in my life at that moment. Proverbs 17, 27. The one who has knowledge restrains his words. And one who keeps a cool head is a person of understanding. Yes, again, my children, unlike Pastor Josh. And in reading these scriptures sitting there, I was not in that moment like, yes, praise the Lord for he is worthy. I was not sitting there like, man, it feels great to serve God right now. These words that I was reading were hard truths that exposed some issues I had in my life. These words were difficult truths that were forcing me to face some realities about myself that were uncomfortable. 
These truths did not leave any room for interpretation. And if I'm being honest today, the natural response to reading these difficult truths is I want to put some distance between myself and the words of the Bible. The natural reaction is I'm very uncomfortable seeing some flaws in myself. So the natural reaction is I want to move away from those truths. The natural response many times that we have to a message that exposes our flaws is not God deliver me from my flaws. It's let me deconstruct and walk away from the words that make me uncomfortable. John chapter 6 verse 65 says this. And Jesus, he's teaching many people at this time. He was doing great works all throughout this book. And then he gets to the very end. And Jesus says to the people that are following him, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. And because of his teaching, because of his truth, because of Jesus' message, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer followed him. Because of his message, many of his disciples at that moment deconstructed. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to listen to your word. I thank you, God, in Hebrews 4 that it says that your word is alive and active, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. God, I thank you that your word today that it would not just expose us, God, but that it would build us up. That it would encourage us. That it would help us to grow into who you've called us to be. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we saw right there at the end of John that many, because of the word that Jesus spoke, that they turned back. And I'm sure that they felt how I felt when I was reading the book of Proverbs. I was using that example in my life to highlight the truth that many times a natural response that we have to pain as humans is denial, is avoidance, or ignoring it. Many times when we're uncomfortable with a situation, the first thing that we do is we try to mentally and emotionally disconnect to avoid the pain. What I've just described to you is a psychological idea known as avoidance coping. Say that with me. Say avoidance coping. And another name for this is emotional avoidance. And all avoidance coping is, is it's a response to pain or discomfort that says, I'm going to avoid an area because it will be painful for me to go there. I'm going to avoid thinking about certain things because it is very uncomfortable for me to think about it. It's like when you're in a moment and something happens and a friend comes to you and says, hey, are you okay? I saw that. And the first reaction is, ah, I don't want to think about it right now. I don't want to talk about that right now. I'm just going to turn on the TV. I just want to zone out because we're avoiding the discomfort that comes with the reality that's set right in front of us. Forms of avoidance coping include ignoring, denial that something happened. Believe it or not, procrastination is a form of avoidance coping. I'm going to leave as much time as possible until I have to deal with something and then I'll jump in and deal with it. Dr. Michelle Maidenberg, she says in her lecture on emotional avoidance, she says we avoid, we deny, we disregard, and we distract ourselves from difficult moments. Watch this. She says, we are masters at distancing ourselves from pain and discomfort. We are masters at distancing ourselves from pain and discomfort. And please hear my heart today. I'm not speaking on this topic from the sidelines. I'm speaking as the team captain of emotional avoidance. I'm here as the chief overseer of emotional avoidance today. And as I begin to think about what is it at its core, at its core, avoidance coping is a denial of truth. At its core, what this is, is the denial of truth. If you've ever been in a moment where you're in a set of emotional avoidance, or you're going away from my idea to feel better. You are right in the middle of avoidance coping. You might have heard it this way. The truth hurts. 
Who here has ever heard that phrase? The truth hurts, right? We say the truth hurts. And I think sometimes it's not the truth that hurts us. It's the fact that we have to let go of certain lies that comfort us. It's not the truth that hurts us. It's letting go of the lies that some of us value oh so dearly. One lie that I've heard a lot, I've heard people say, I'm useless. Really? There is not a single use for your existence. You're completely useless. Yes, I'm useless. Well, do you sleep at night? Well, yeah, I sleep. Guess what? There's a job where all you do is you sleep and scientists study you sleep. So you have use. And maybe you're saying, I'm so useless, I don't sleep. Ha, gotcha. There are also scientists that need to study the effects of a lack of sleep. So by virtue of you sleeping or not sleeping, you have a use. But here's the reality. Saying that I'm useless is you forming a sense of identity that gives you some comfort. Comfort. By saying, I'm useless, you're not saying there's areas that I can't do anything. You're saying my identity is being a useless person. And to stop believing that you're useless is to lose a piece of who you are. And many times you want to hold on to the lies rather than interact with the truth. We deny truth so that we can hold on to our perspective, onto our reality, onto our viewpoints. And it works for a while to say, you know what, I'm going to deny the truth. There are many belief systems that allow the denial of truth in the world today. They say, whatever's true for you is true for you. Whatever is true for me is true for me. We just got to vibe with the earth, bro. <laughs> just vibe with the earth. Truth, shh, don't worry about it. Just stick your feet in the soil, get all nasty, and you're good. Just vibe with the earth. And that's fine many times, right? It's fine to be in your bubble and say, what's true for me is true for me. And maybe it was fine in your life for a while. But then Jesus walks up and he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So we can hold on to our own truths all day. But when truth itself walks into the room, we all know at the end of the day, you cannot deny that truth. So we see this in, in the Bible a lot, that Jesus uses these I am statements. And it's not a mistranslation. Jesus did not mean to say, I have the way, I have the truth. No, he's saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. What does God identify himself as in the burning bush when he's talking to Moses? He says, my name is I am. Well, what do you mean I am? I am truth itself. I am wisdom itself. I am life. I am Zoe. So we see this weird idea that Jesus doesn't just possess these things, but he is the essence of them. So when Jesus says, I am the truth, we know that every single thing that is not aligned with him is a lie. And we see in the book of Proverbs that the Bible says that by wisdom the earth was formed. We see in the New Testament that Jesus is the one that forms the earth. In other words, Jesus Christ is wisdom. So when I'm reading through Proverbs and I see the words that say a fool gives full vent to his spirit, it is a foolish thing to be angry. I'm actually brushing up against Jesus. And that was making me uncomfortable in those moments, right? Right? So I'm brushing up against wisdom, and in those moments, I'm feeling uncomfortable. What's funny about this uncomfortable truth about Jesus is it's often the very thing that we need. That being uncomfortable with Jesus is the thing that will set us free from the areas of bondage that we have in our lives. And I believe that this uncomfort of the Word of God, this uncomfort that comes with knowing Jesus as your Lord is the reason why many people deconstruct from the faith. That many people get to a point where they say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Seeing the truth is hard sometimes, right? Because it forces us to let go of the lies and people get to a point where they say, I can't do this anymore. In, other, in other words, I believe that many people go on this journey of deconstruction to avoid the pain 
of me construction. Many people will go on this journey of deconstruction to avoid the pain and the discomfort of me construction. And the title of my message today is me construction. Say that with me, say me construction. And today I want to talk to the person or the people that might have deconstructed from the faith because Jesus doesn't preach what you want to hear. For those who have deconstructed from the faith because of the difficulty of the message of the gospel. And we see this in John chapter 6 in the Bible. We see in John chapter 6 that the first half that it is amazing seeing the ministry of Jesus. It says in verse 3 of John chapter 6 that there was a huge crowd following Jesus because of the miracles that he performed on the sick. Go Jesus, hey, go Jesus, hey, go Jesus. It says in verse 12 that Jesus fed at least 5,000 people by taking a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Free food? Bro. Free food. Go, Jesus. Hey, go, Jesus. Hey, go, Jesus. Hey. Verse 14, it says that the people were so amazed by what he did, they said, let's grab him and force him to be our king. Go, Jesus. Hey, go, Jesus. Hey. Verse 19, he walks on water. Go, Jesus. Hey, go, Jesus. Hey. And then around verse 35, Jesus' message shifts from free food to follow me. Ooh. Mm. Uh, we gonna have pizza if we follow you? I mean, he goes from satisfying all their earthly needs to surrender to my father. Uh, where the fish at, though? I mean, we, we still kind of hungry. It goes from giving them all the pleasure in the world to saying, here's the purpose of all creation. Uh, and maybe the 12 disciples are like, go, G oh, <laughs> I don't know about that, that, that message that, that, that Jesus is saying. And then it's like as the passage goes up, he keeps ramping it up. He keeps ramping it up. And he ends by saying, if you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you will live forever because God sent me. I am the bread of life. And they're like, bro, I drove 30 hours to see this man preach. You told me it would be free food. And he's out here making these outrageous claims. You see, it was very easy to follow Jesus when it was all, all the, the games and the prizes and all the miracles. But the second that Jesus brought the message of the truth, the people got very upset. They were following him for the miracles, not for who he was. They were following God for what he can do for me instead of who he is in creation. And that is backwards. And now I'm going to pick up this story in verse 59. It says that Jesus was saying these things, these messages, while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Everybody say synagogue. So when we see something like that in scripture, the, what it's doing is it's showing us this is like a church setting. It wasn't exactly the same, but it would be religious people hearing this message. In verse 60, it says that when many of his disciples, so more than just the 12, when many of his disciples heard this message, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus being aware that his disciples were complaining about his message, he said to them, does this message offend you? He was saying, I am the son of God. He's like, if those words offend you, then he says in the next verse or later on, what are you going to do when you see the son of man or see me ascending back to heaven? If me claiming to be God is offending you, what are you going to do when I demonstrate it? Verse 63, it says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. He then says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words that Jesus speaks are spirit and they are life. These words will bring you from death to life. And these are the very words that offend the people that are listening. Verse 64, watch what Jesus says. He says to them, to his disciples, but among you there are some 
who do not believe. It says that they're his disciples in verse 60. And then he says, among those of you who are following me, there are some of you who do not believe. How is that possible? Because you can be more committed to the miracles of God than the God of the miracles. You can be more committed to the provision of God than the God of the provision. You could be more committed to the healing of God than the healer himself. You see, everything that God does for us flows from who he is. And sometimes because we're closer to what God does to us than the person of the miracles, we can leave the second that the miracles stop. We lose our faith the second that we don't see what we want to see. It says in the next part of the verse, for Jesus knew from first who were the ones that did not believe. So it's not just Judas. There were multiple people that were following him yet not believing in him. And then it says, and he knew who the one was that would betray him. Verse 65, and he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. And then verse 66 where we started, and because of this teaching... Many of his disciples, they turned back and they no longer followed him. Jesus on a platter, he offers them, here is spirit and life. And at the offer of life, they say, I don't want life. I just want the miracles. In other words, these people, they weren't emotionally avoiding God. They were spiritually avoiding God. It was a form of spiritual avoidance coping. Rather than interact with the truth of who God is, rather than interact with the truth of God's word, they'd rather walk away. They would rather deconstruct. And one of the most wonderful things about Christianity and one of the most difficult things about Christianity is that Jesus doesn't base his sermons on what we want to hear. He bases his sermons on what we need. He doesn't base his sermons on what's just going to be what we want to hear. He bases his message on what is going to give us spirit and life. He doesn't give us the message that we always want to hear, but he does give us the message that will always set us free. And that can be difficult sometimes. Maybe you've been this person before, or maybe you're struggling with this right now. That every time you hear a sermon that you like, you got to leave the church. You say, ah, that church, psh, I can't be in that church. They preached a sermon that I didn't like. And now you're on church number 17. And you just talk to your friends like, man, there's just no churches around here that are good. There's just, there's just nothing. And it's okay in church, but if somebody came up to you and said, man, my last 17 spouses, they, there's the, they need to work on them. They, they don't know how to treat me. They don't know how to care for me. And you said, well, your last spouse? No, my last 17. <sighs> now, you know I love you, right? Is it possible that the 17 other people weren't the problem and you are the problem? Is it possible that the last 17 churches preach the word of God and it is the truth of God's word that makes you avoidance cope and get out of there? Let's move on. Let's move on. Let, let, let's keep it going. These disciples, they walk away from God as a form of avoidance coping. They hear these truths that are uncomfortable, so they walk away from Jesus and this is exactly the feeling that I had when I was reading through the book of Proverbs and I was seeing realities about myself that were uncomfortable. It's like, ugh, that's uncomfortable. I want to walk away from it. And one thing I love about the Bible is it says that God's glory is written in all of creation. So there's two types of revelation. There's general revelation that we can see in all of creation. And then there's what we call like divine revelation directly from God. So I was reading that quote before from Dr. Maidenberg where she says, 
that we avoid, we deny, we disregard, and we distract ourselves from dis- difficult moments. We are masters at distancing ourselves from pain and discomfort. But as I look at that, that quote that she made, and I look at the human condition in regards to our relationship with God, it seems to be equally as clue. We avoid God. We deny God. We disregard God. And we distract ourselves from difficult moments with God. We are masters at distancing ourselves from the pain and the discomfort of God's word. We are masters at distancing ourselves from the truths that would actually set us free if we leaned into them. And one thing that's difficult to hear, but it is very relevant for our lives today, is that it is often the most difficult sermons for us to hear when we need to lean in the closest. For example, if I stood up here today and I said, today we're talking about forgiving our family members that hurt us. And you go, oh. And you might actually subconsciously start to tune me out the second you hear the topic. That's an indication that you have an area in your life you need to work on. If I stood up here today and I said, today we're going to talk about being generous to those around you. And you go, uh, could we get more fish and loaves, please? <laughs> That's not why I got up. I usually wake up at noon. And I woke up to hear a message that's going to make me uncomfortable. If there's a topic in the scripture in God's word that makes you uncomfortable, that's an indication to run into that area, not to avoid it. Because that's where freedom is in our lives today. In verse 60, it says that when many of Jesus' disciples, when they heard his message, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? The word for difficult there is the Greek word skeleros. And what it means is it's the idea of a piece of leather that is completely dried out. Or it's like saying figuratively, this word that Jesus gave is stubborn. This message that he gave is unyielding. This message will not budge. The final definition, this message is unyieldingly harsh. The truth is unyieldingly harsh. It's like the image of seeing a crowbar. This crowbar, if I try to bend it with my thumb, guess what? I'm going to break my thumb before I can bend this crowbar. The message of the truth of the gospel is like this crowbar. And this is actually called a wrecking bar. This message is not going to bend if I try to put pressure on it. The word of God is not going to lose its form even if I try with all my strength to bend this message. It says in here the teaching or the logos, the message of God, that spoken word of God is unyielding. And this unyielding message of Christ is often very difficult for us to deal with because it doesn't move. Many times we want a Christianity that's like this. We want a Christianity that will bend around as we want it to bend. Forgiveness, woo, we go bend away from that one real quick. Helping those around you, woo. Proverbs, it says, do not withhold good from those when you're able to do it. And I'm like, I've done that a lot. Let's bend back this way, right? We want a message that can bend with whatever we want it to do. But here's the thing about this message. The message that can bend can be broken. The message that can bend can be broken. But the message that doesn't bend will break the chains off of our lives. The message that doesn't bend is the very thing that will set us free. In this walk with God, in this journey with God, there are going to be moments when we come into contact with this truth, with this word that does not bend. 
And this is at the core of me construction. We ask ourselves, what things am I holding on to that God is asking me to release? What habits have I formed that I hold to so de dearly? What identities do I hold? What struggles do I hold on to so dearly that God is asking me to release? What do I do if I'm the person that is wrestling with God over an area in my life? And that's me as well. How do I undertake this process of me construction? Number one, it is my first point today for taking notes, write this down. We start with the foundation. We start with the foundation. First Corinthians chapter three, verse 11 says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There is no foundation of our faith other than Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, every single one of us is wasting our time here today. The Bible says our faith is in vain. Our faith is useless if Jesus did not raise. Why? Because Jesus Christ and his resurrection is the foundation of our faith. Maybe you've deconstructed and you say, I'm not going to be a part of church because Jesus condemns me. I'm not going to be a Christian because Jesus condemns me. The most famous Bible verse in all of Christianity, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that, who, that whoever would believe in would not perish but have everlasting life. You know what the next verse says? That God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved through him. Now, the reason that many people deconstruct because of condemnation is because Christians have condemned them, but not God. Christians have condemned the people that God sent his son to save. The message of the gospel is not that Jesus condemns us. The message of the gospel is that we're all condemned in our own strength. We don't need anybody else to condemn us because we are professionals at condemning ourselves. But if it wasn't for God's grace and sending his son to save us, then when we respond to the message of his gospel, we are then saved. So if you've deconstructed because of the idea of Jesus condemning you, I want to encourage you, go back to the foundation and start with Christ. Number two, we build with the truth. Say that with me. Say, build with the truth. We have an amazing recovery program here called Celebrate Recovery. And if you've seen uh, CR people, can I have some noise real quick? Amazing, amazing program. And one thing that many recovery programs have is they start with b combating avoidance coping. You say, hi, my name is Pastor Josh. And I struggle with giving feedback to authority figures in my life. What am I doing? I'm identifying myself and I'm saying the truth. And it might seem backwards. I don't want to say the truth because the truth hurts. Jesus says, you will know the truth, him, and the truth will set you free. Say, hi, my name is Josh. Here's what I struggle with. Everybody in the room acknowledges you. Hi, Josh. I see what you struggle with, and then I realize I'm still alive. I'm still breathing. The truth didn't destroy me. It's actually the truth that is helping me. John 14, 6, Jesus says to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Maybe you've deconstructed and you've said, you know what, I don't want to wear the bondage of Christianity. I need you to understand today that there is no greater freedom than being bound up in God's grace. There is no greater freedom than being bound up in the love of our Father. I want you to know that being bound up by the grace of God is much more liberating than the chains of I can do this on my own. And third and final tip, I want us to redefine the process. Say that with me. Say, redefine the process. Many times we look at the process of growth 
as a bad thing rather than a good thing. We look at the process of apologizing to somebody that we hurt as a bad thing rather than a good thing. And the reason that we do that is we see the pain that's going to happen when we go and apologize to someone. But we don't see the breakthrough that might happen in their life and in our life by the very fact that we just said sorry. Someone in here, like before you get out the parking lot, just say sorry. Just call them and say sorry. Jesus says, and I love this scripture, that if we go to worship and we bring our offering to God, but we have issues with someone, he says, leave that offering on the altar, leave it there, get out of church, and go make peace with your brother. Jesus would rather us make peace with those around us than come to church and sing 17 worship songs. It's a beautiful thing to see, but it can be difficult. The thing is about this wrecking bar of God's word, as we know, who knows it hurts when you get hit by this, right? It, it, I told the teens before when they were worshiping, I was bringing this up. I was like, if y'all don't worship, I'm going to come see you with this wrecking bar. This analogy fails that if I was to hit you with this, it would destroy you. To get hit with the truth of God's word, it will build you up. It will restore you. It will bring healing to broken areas. The truth of God's word will not break you down. Well, let me put it this way. It deconstructs you, but in an instant, it reconstructs you. It breaks you down, but it builds you back way stronger than you ever could have in your own strength. So if you're here today, and I, I want to do two prayers today. First of all, I want to pray for anyone that is struggling with unforgiveness in your heart. I want us all to bow our heads, close our eyes. And if you're here today and you're struggling with unforgiveness, I want us to do a mini Celebrate Recovery start. I want you, you don't have to say anything, to just wave at me and I'm going to say I see you. If you struggle with unforgiveness today, I want you to wave at me. I'm going to, I see you, 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 I see you. I see you. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that we can forgive others because you first forgave us. I thank you, Lord, that you did not hold our sins against us, but that you made a way when there was no way on our own. And I pray, Lord, that we can, as believers, that we can imitate you today, that just as you first forgave us, May we forgive those who need our forgiveness, God. I thank you, God, in our hearts that we would not focus on what they did to us, but that we would focus on what you did for us. And because of what you did for us, we can in turn forgive those who are around us. I thank you for these things, and I thank you for healing in our hearts right now in this moment. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for healing in this moment. And I thank you, God, that your word is true and that your word will not return void. In Jesus' name, amen. And today I want to pray a second prayer. This is known as the prayer of salvation. If you've never made a decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, we all pray this prayer together. It goes like this. Repeat after me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.